So today we're going to be wrestling with some questions. Is God still good when everything goes bad? Can we trust God when everything is falling apart? Is God there? Does God even care? Now, these are questions that many of us have asked and wrestled with at some point in our lives. And we likely will continue to ask and wrestle with these questions because these are good questions, they're fair questions, but I think it's important for us to understand that these are not new questions. As a matter of fact, the book of Job, which is considered by many scholars to be one of the oldest books in the Bible, is 42 chapters reflecting on these questions, wrestling, with how we can reconcile the goodness of God with the suffering that we experience. And what I hope that we can accomplish today is after spending some time looking at these words from Job, as we reflect on the character of Jesus and we wrestle with these questions in the context of relationships, that we can discover what it looks like to suffer full of hope. And so today I've got some friends on stage with me that are gonna help us in this conversation. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna kind of just do a setup for this conversation where I'm gonna introduce some ideas, I'm gonna introduce some scriptures, and then we're going to discuss this on stage. For those of you that are watching at Switch IRL right now, when we go to our on stage discussion, you're gonna actually take that time to wrestle with these questions in your small group. Because what we believe is that information is a good thing. Right, learning more things about the Bible and God and how we're called to live is a good thing. But content will never ever replace meaningful connections. We believe that life change happens in the context of relationships. And so what I'm gonna do here is take some time to just set up the big idea and some of the truths from scripture. Then we'll transition into some conversation and then we'll come back to wrap this whole thing up and hopefully at the end of this, know a little bit more about how we can suffer hopefully how we can reconcile the goodness of God with the suffering that we experience. So let's take a minute to just talk about Job. So Job is uh, 42 chapters that are basically meditating on the question, how could God allow bad things to happen to good people? And what's important for us to understand about the book of Job is that if we want to read it wisely, we have to remember a few things about the Bible specifically and then the book of Job. So the Bible, let's just start with tip number one for reading Job wisely, or as I like to say, not reading Job in a way that is janky. Come on, somebody. I actually just, I just made that up on the spot. They said that was good, so I'm gonna keep rolling. Um, <laughs> so here's tip number one. We have to remember that the Bible is not a textbook that gives us easy answers. Instead, the Bible is a story that leads us to Jesus and helps us to develop wisdom. And in this story that we call the Bible, it is a collection of documents and writings written by dozens of authors over the course of hundreds of years. But all of that is telling the same story, the story of God and the story of us, the story of God's redemptive plan to rescue humanity from sin and restore creation. And so we've got to put Job in that context because if we try to read it like a textbook with the answers to our questions, then I'm telling you, you're going to run into some trouble real quick. The second thing we have to understand is that Job is believed to be by many scholars, wisdom literature. It's wisdom literature. What that means is that the book of Job is intentionally written in such a way as to help us develop wisdom for how to live in our fallen and broken world. Because the reality is, is that our world is fallen. It has been infected by this disease called sin. And that disease of sin has introduced all of the bad things in our world that we don't want and aren't supposed to be there. And because of that, God, through the power of his spirit, inspired these different authors to write different books and chapters in the Bible to help us wrestle with the challenges of our world and to live well as God's people. The third thing that we need to understand about the book of Job is that the point is not to provide easy answers or empty promises. As a matter of fact, the book of Job is written in such a way to invite us to let go of easy answers, to reject empty promises, and through the process of wrestling with God, come to a more full understanding of just how good and loving he is. And throughout these 42 chapters, wrestling with the question, why do bad things happen to good people? We're gonna find these pockets of hope that I believe are gonna help us live today in a way that is good and that is true. So the book of Job, it's kind of a big deal. I'm a pretty big fan. 
Uh, it took me a long time to actually appreciate the book of Job because I'll be honest with you, the first, I don't know, like seven times I read it, I was like, oh, cool, 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 cool. This makes no sense to me. Why are these dudes talking in poetry? Yeah. Right. Like it was super weird. But the more that I've come to understand the book of Job, the more I've been able to appreciate the wisdom that's contained within. So here are the big questions being asked throughout these 42 chapters. The questions being asked are, hey, is God still good when everything goes bad? And how do we respond when life is falling apart? And then in addition to that, the question that we're gonna focus in on today is, is it possible to suffer hopefully? So the book of Job starts by introducing us to Job. And the book of Job tells us that, hey, this is a dude who lived in the land of Uz and his name was Job and he was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Then we go to the scene in the heavenly realm where God is basically being put on trial by the adversary, the Satan, where uh, this, this character, Satan, is basically questioning if God is actually good. He's basically saying, hey God, the only reason that Job honors you is because you keep giving him good things. But if you take away the blessings in his life, then Job is gonna curse you to your face. So God is being put on trial. And we as the readers are having to wrestle with, okay, like this seems a little bit strange, which what is going on here? And then in the next scene, God basically gives this adversary, this Satan permission to bring immense suffering upon Job in ways that honestly to us don't make sense, right? It forces us to ask the question, okay, God, why would you let this happen? And then what we see is that Job proceeds to lose everything. And like we had just learned that Job is a righteous man. He is blameless. He fears God and he avoids evil. And now everything in his world is falling apart. And Job's response to the suffering, it's just to say some words that I'm gonna be honest, don't really make a lot of sense for most of us. Because when people go through immense suffering, our kind of default reactions are typically to blame God to be angry with God, to assume that God just doesn't care, or maybe to assume that God isn't even there. What starts as frustration and blame can eventually turn to, okay, God, I'm done with you. And yet Job responds by saying, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. May the name of the Lord be praised be praised. In the face of immense suffering, Job is holding on to hope. And then in the next chapter, starting uh, at the end of chapter two, we uh, hear about Job's three friends who are coming to comfort him. Those friends are Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. And they heard about all the troubles that had come upon Job. They set out from their homes. They met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. So they began to weep aloud. They tore their robes. They sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. None of them said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. What they were doing is uh, this Jewish practice known as sitting shiva, sitting shiva. It's this practice that the Jewish people would do to comfort those who were mourning. Because when people were met with immense suffering, as tempting as it can be for us to offer them easy answers or empty promises, oftentimes it's the last thing that they need. Usually what they need is not somebody to try to fix the problem or take the pain away, but somebody that's just willing to be there. And for seven days and seven nights, that's what Job's friends did for him. But eventually it got to the point where Job was ready to speak. Job was ready to vent a little bit and express his anger and frustration at his situation. And so we read in uh, the beginning of uh, that next chapter where Job opens his mouth and he curses the day of his birth. He basically says, hey, it would be better if I had never been born. And then Job begins to ask some questions about the character of God because Job knows that he's innocent. He knows that he hasn't done anything wrong. And in Job's world, the vast majority of people assumed that God rewards the righteous and that sinners suffer. And here is Job, a man who is righteous and blameless. And all of a sudden he is experiencing immense suffering. So Job, 
is now wrestling with the question, God, why would you let this happen to me, right? I still trust that you're good, but I'm gonna be honest with you, it's really, really hard to hold onto hope. And what we read over the next 30 or so chapters is Job questioning and asking, God, why would you let this happen? And then we read Job's friends trying to justify why Job is experiencing suffering because in their mind, they couldn't get out of the view that says, hey, God rewards the righteous and sinners suffer. So Job, you must have done something wrong. Just admit it, just own it. And we watch as Job tries to hold on to hope, tries to suffer hopefully in the face of these friends of his that were there to comfort him, but now are questioning him. Job continues to wrestle with the question that all of us wrestle with. Do we trust that God is still good when everything goes bad? Why is it that God would allow bad things to happen to good people? How do we reconcile the character of God that's supposed to be loving and good with the reality of suffering that so many of us face? And so what we'll do a little bit later is we'll come back and reveal what I believe is the heart of this story that's gonna help us suffer with hope. But first, I want us to just have some space to be honest, to process and wrestle with the suffering that we've experienced personally and the suffering that we've seen people we care about go through. Because what I hope is true for every single one of you that are a part of Switch is that you would know that Switch is a place that you can be real, where you can ask the hard questions, where you can wrestle with difficult truths because we're not a ministry that's about providing easy answers. Instead, what we wanna do is walk alongside you as you discover the truth of who God is and who he's made you to be. So in this time of discussion, we're gonna wrestle with three questions. Question number one is how do you respond to suffering? Question number two is how do you respond when others are suffering? And then finally, question number three, we're gonna ask this is, do you still believe that God is good when life is not? So we're gonna wrestle with these questions together. For those of you that are switched in real life, you're gonna wrestle with those questions with your small group. But before we get to that, I just wanna pray for our time. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that this is a place where we can be real where we can wrestle with the difficult questions of life and we can do it in the context of trusted relationships. God, I pray that every single one of us would be willing to bring these questions to you, that we would work through the difficulty and choose to trust that even when everything is going wrong, that God, you are still good. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So, y'all ready? Question number one, we're gonna start with uh, you, Mr. Bo, youth pastor out at Life Church South Oklahoma City. How do you respond to suffering? Yeah, suffering is something that is, uh, it's, it's hard to navigate um, because sometimes it's hard to really understand the depth and the gravity of what you're going through in the actual moment. You know, you don't understand how severe it is. You don't understand where it's always coming from. You don't always understand the why as we're learning about tonight. And I think the, the thing that always helps me is being reminded of the gifts that I've been given. And when I talk about that, I mean like, Jesus gave us the best gift that we could ever imagine. That is the gift of salvation. Come on. And if I really, really, really believe that that is the best gift ever given, then do I even need anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Like, if I never got one more good thing in my entire life, do I really need anything else other than that gift? And when I'm re reminding of myself of that, it helps, um, but it's something that I have to continually rem remind myself of all the time. So good, so good. Jennifer, what about you? Um, yeah, I think it can be really hard to wrestle with suffering when I know that God is good. And I know that what you talked about earlier, that like the tomb is empty and that Jesus is risen and that it ends with us celebrating that with him forever. And yet sometimes I wanna skip past the wrestling and the suffering part and just like, but I know that we win and I just like wanna will myself through the pain and I wanna will the people I love through it. Come on. And it's like, wait, I have to sit here and, and kind of ask God, I need you to remind me that you are in control and I'm not. Like yeah. I almost crave those moments that God said to Job. I don't, can I give away the punchline? Sorry, <laughs> no, I don't good. wanna give keep away going. the punchline. Keep okay. going, keep going. But I just, it's like, I want God to look at me and go, you're, you're finite and yeah. I am forever. 
Yeah. And I can see the big picture when you can't. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, that's definitely the rest of the message. So I'm going to wing it from Sorry. here on out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ty, what about you, man? Man, uh, so one of the things I get to do almost every single week and weekend is lead people in worship. And we sing these songs that have these incredible lyrics. And then I stand on stage during the hardest seasons of my life and I have to sing these words yeah. that sometimes are really, really challenging to actually believe. But uh, the, the best thing about those lyrics is that uh, they really are true. Come on. And so sometimes it's okay for me to just rest in that or even to like ball my face out when I'm singing on stage or driving in the car and knowing that those words are true. And so I'm going to be okay. I'm going to get through it. And as I remind other people, I feel like God is reminding me of Come those on. words as well. So yeah. That's so good. All right. Off topic question. What is the least helpful thing somebody has said to you when you're in the middle of a difficult season? Jennifer, you, you, you look yeah, like you're I ready. It. I got it. Um, <laughs> someone actually said to me, if you just have enough faith, mm. then Come on. God would heal this issue. Yep. That's good. And, and, and the hard thing is I was in so much pain. Right. And I was like a young adult believer. And it really kind of shook me because right. I was experiencing that. Like, yeah. But God, I love you. But God, I know you can. But God, why aren't you? And and it took some work for me to go. That is not true. Right. <laughs> that. Right. That is not biblical. That right. is not anywhere. Come on. The Apostle Paul prayed and prayed and asked God, "Would you relieve me?" He for yeah. sure had more faith than I do right now. Like, come on, dude. That's well, not it. So just to clarify. Don't say that. Right. Just to clarify, when I come on and amen to that, that was super sarcastic. Right. I want to make sure you know, I don't actually think that that's good preaching. Do uh, not say so, that. Well, so what's crazy is I remember multiple times people coming up to me in the middle of my wife's health issues being the worst they had ever been saying to me, hey, if you just pray like this, right. then God will fix it. Yep. And here's the thing. I, like at that point, I was literally willing to try anything. And so I prayed like that. All the time. And it felt so awkward. Yeah. And every time I prayed like that, you know, they, they, they basically it was some version of, hey, like if you name it and claim it, come on somebody. If you believe it, you'll receive it. If you decree it, then it will be it. I don't know. I don't know. But, 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 but it literally was one of those situations where I felt this sense of, okay, like I'll try it. Like I'll try whatever. Like I'll do whatever it takes to help my wife be healed from this illness that she's been struggling with. But what I found myself getting to as I would start the prayers in that way is landing at a place where I would end it by saying, okay, God, not my will, your will be done. Yeah. And it's like, oh crud, maybe I'm not supposed to pray that way. But I feel like that's often how Jesus prayed. Yeah. And it, it just brought me to this place of like, okay, like how much faith do I really need? Right. Like, I think I need to have the faith the size of a mustard seed. So I have enough faith to just follow Jesus. Yeah. Come on. Then he's gonna lead me wherever I need to go. And so, yeah. Were those sarcastic? That's good, or are those real? No, that was good. Oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. All right, Ty, uh, what about you, man? What was the, what was the question? Uh, the question was, what is, what is the least helpful <laughs> advice you've been given? Bro, so it's not advice, but when people say like, oh, you'll, you'll be okay. I'm like, well, I, I know that I'm going to be okay. You know that I'm going to be okay. Yeah, but that's on. actually not helpful right now. And so whether it's just you shut up and listen for that mm. moment or, or not give advice at all, um, it's not helpful to tell me that I'm going to be okay when I'm trying to process something challenging or difficult or the season that I'm going through. And so, right. yeah. Man, I, I, yep. You'll be okay. Just because it's true <laughs> doesn't mean it's always helpful yeah. in the moment. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. All right, Bo. I think for me, it just comes down to the fact when people try to solve my problems for me, you know, like they just get there, like they, they just like dig in and they're like, well, what's going on? Like, what are you doing in your life? Like, what, what, what are you not doing or what are you supposed to be doing that you should be doing? And, and they're like trying to dig in and Sherlock Holmes, my, my life and my stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, hey, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't want to be suffering either. Like, yeah. I want to get through this and Come I want to grow and I want to be more like Christ after this, but I don't always know how to do that and so you trying to dig in is not always helpful right yeah. well and the thing is though we know that when people are trying to do that they're trying to be helpful for sure right, right? like that that's what's motivating people when they're offering these things that for lack of a better term are easy answers yeah. 
are empty promises. And I think that's the beauty of the story of Job is it helps us understand that, hey, life is way bigger and more complicated than these easy answers can solve for us. And you know, I think this is the thing that is oftentimes so challenging because I so desperately want to help others. And I have to be reminded that sometimes the most helpful thing I can do is just sit and listen. Because ultimately at the end of the day, that's what people need when they're really hurting. Okay, y'all ready for the next question? So how do you respond when others are suffering? Right? We talked about what do you do when you're suffering? We talked about what should people not do? So let's kind of wrap this up by talking about how do you respond when somebody you care about is going through a difficult time? Absolutely. Man, I think one of the things I do is listen, and we just talked about that. Like m- most people, they just need a friend. Uh, that's it. Simple as that. Someone to lend them, lend me your ear, <laughs> like lend them your, your ear and then and just listen and allow them the opportunity to process whatever it is with you. Um, and then you can chime in and then you can give an encouraging word. But from jump, like what people typically want is just someone to hear their heart. Yeah, so good. Jennifer? Um, one of the ways that I don't handle it well is when I want to go fix it for them. <laughs> and I have to remind myself like, This isn't mine to fix. Right. And so let me just kind of stay back here, take my own few breaths, because I feel it, especially when I care about somebody, like I'm feeling their pain. And I think back to that time that I was in so much suffering and my friend Amy came and literally sat on the floor of my living room and just sat with me and she got teary eyed with me. And all she said was, I'm so sorry. And is there anything I can do? And it was that moment that I was like, somebody gets me. Like somebody understands that there is so much pain in here that I don't even have words to put to it. And so that is the kind of response I want to give people is just how can I be with you in it and not try to fix it and not try to make it mine, but just sit here and love you. Come on. Yeah, I think that's so good. That's basically what I was going to say. And I think that's just a question that I have to ask myself is why do I want to help? Like, what am I trying to accomplish as I'm trying to help? Am I trying to be the savior? Am wow. I trying to be the hero? Do I simply want to help? Come or like on. what angle am I coming from? Because oftentimes, honestly, I'll be honest, like sometimes I do want to be the hero. Like I want to, I want to step in. I want to meet that need. I want to step in and I want to wow. provide what, what they need. But if I am not doing it from the right heart of, uh, of serving alongside Jesus as he solves the problems, yeah. as he works in their life, then I don't really need to be digging in. And so that's just a question that I have to ask myself all the time is, am I doing it for me or am I doing it for God? Yeah. Mm, that's so good, man. So as we are uh, wrapping up these conversations, what I wanna do is kind of introduce you to a concept that is very commonly found throughout Hebrew poetry. It's called the parallelism. So parallelism. It's this idea that oftentimes in Hebrew poetry, which many scholars believe Job is written as a poetic retelling of a story that is based on a real person in a real place who had real things happen to him. But this idea of a parallelism looks like if you've got like A, B, A, right? It starts here with A, then comes back to A. Or it's like A, B, C, B, A. The concept is that in the center of that parallelism is some gold that is meant to be discovered by us, the readers. And if we look at the book of Job, there's this really brilliant work that's been done by a actually Japanese theologian where he mapped out the entire book of Job and identified the center of that parallelism. And he identified it as Job chapter 28. And so oftentimes when we think about the stories that most of us are familiar with, right? The moral comes at the very end of the story. But in Hebrew poetry, oftentimes the moral is buried in the center, right at the heart of it. And what I wanna do is I wanna read to you part of Job 28, because I think that what this chapter does is it helps us have the right perspective to wrestle with the question of whether or not God is good when everything is going bad. The question of why would a good and loving God allow bad things to happen 
to good people. And so in the first like 19 verses of Job 28, basically what Job is doing is he's rattling off all the incredible accomplishments that humanity has achieved, right? He's talking about the idea that human beings have literally figured out how to go into mountains and mine out gold and silver and precious jewels, right? Which like for them, that's a big deal. And if he were writing this to us today, he'd probably say like, dude, we put somebody on the moon. Right? We have the internet. We can be connected to people on the other side of the planet in milliseconds. He talked about the idea that through scientific discovery, we have a better understanding of the vastness of the universe. But in spite of all of our knowledge and accomplishments, the thing that we're still missing is wisdom. And that's what Job, this book, is inviting us to discover. So what we're gonna do is we're going to pick up in verse 20 of Job chapter 28, where the question is asked, this is Job speaking, where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it and he alone knows where it dwells for he views the ends of the earth. He sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and he measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and he appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. So at the heart of this story, 42 chapters wrestling with the question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? You know what we're not given? We're not given an easy answer. We're not given an empty promise. Instead, what God is doing is he's inviting us to trust him, to follow him, to do what's right when everything seems wrong. I know that there are some of you right now where honestly, you hear that and you're like, yeah, that sounds really good, but that feels like an easy answer. And to that, I would just say, man, put it into practice. Whatever struggle you might be facing, what would it look like for you to not reject God altogether, but to run to him? What would it look like for you to wrestle with God when life honestly, is falling apart? What would it look like to surround yourself with other people that would be there for you to encourage you, to sit with you in the middle of the pain? Because the very tempting thing to do is to be confronted by the reality of suffering and turn our backs on God. But the thing that so many of us are missing is wisdom. We're missing the perspective that God has because what God sees is not just your suffering in this moment, but God sees the redemption that is coming in your future. You see, the book of Job is pointing to the reality that the answer we're looking for is found through trusting God and doing what's right. It's not something that's easy and it's not at all empty, but that wisdom The thing that we need, the thing that we're desperate for can only be found through sticking close to God when everything in us wants to run away. The thing that I think is so beautiful about this reality though is that for those of us who are living today in the year 2021, we have perspective that Job didn't. We have seen a promise be fulfilled that Job could only dream of and hint at. And this is what's so important for us to wrap our minds around is that Christianity doesn't respond to suffering with easy answers or empty promises. Listen to me, Christianity responds with the person of Jesus who is the suffering servant and our crucified King. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 30 literally said, that God made Jesus to be wisdom itself, that the wisdom we're searching for was searching for us, that that wisdom was made manifest in the person of Jesus who showed up in history 2000 years ago to enter suffering with us, to endure suffering for us. 
Because God is not distant or detached. God cares deeply for every single one of you that is walking through life in pain right now. And through the person of Jesus, we can find comfort for today. And because Jesus, who is our suffering servant, who is the crucified King, did not stay dead. We have hope for redemption in the future because what we know is that the end of the story is not suffering and pain. The end of the story is God taking everything that's broken and putting it back together. The end of the story is God making all things new. The Christian hope is based on the fact that Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave through his own death and resurrection. And that the same Jesus who did not stay dead will eventually return to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises, a day when every wrong is made right, when every hurt is healed, when suffering is no more. You see, God isn't sitting in heaven simply giving us these easy answers or empty promises. No, God entered history 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus to do for us what we could never do on our own, to die a death we deserved, to bring us life that we could never achieve on our own, to bring redemption to the suffering that so many of us have walked through. And so to close, what I wanna do is read to you some words from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter five, where he is helping us to understand that because of Jesus, even in the middle of suffering, we can have hope. Here's what he says, starting in verse one of chapter five. He says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God doesn't respond to your suffering with easy answers or empty promises. God responds to your suffering in the person of Jesus. And so how do we suffer hopefully? We trust God. We trust that God is good even when life is going wrong. We choose to do what's right, even when everything else is falling apart. Because we know that we are not suffering alone. We know that our suffering is never wasted. And that in the end, God is going to bring redemption. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now so thankful of the reality of just how good and loving you are. We thank you that even though we suffer now, that you have a plan to bring about redemption to all of your creation. That God, the end of the story is not suffering and death, but the end is resurrection life. And so God, as we are navigating the suffering of today, I pray that you would help us to give you the trust that sometimes we just wanna hold on to. And what I know is that there are some of you that as you're hearing this message, you're walking through something excruciating where you don't know if you have the strength to keep moving forward. But today you realize that you've been trying to wrestle with those problems on your own and you want God's help to give you the strength to keep moving forward, to trust in him, even when life is falling apart. At all of our locations at Switch Inner Life, if that's you, simply lift your hand up so I can pray for you. If you're watching at Switch online or on YouTube, type it in the chat, leave a comment below. And Heavenly Father, I just ask that these students who are asking you for strength and help 
would feel the presence of your spirit that is living inside them. That they would be reminded of the truth that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in them. That God, you would surround them with people who love them and care for them. That God, they would be open. They would be honest with their friends, their family, their small group about the struggles that they're experiencing. And that God, you would bring them comfort. Now I know that there's likely another group of you in here that this whole idea of suffering, this whole idea of the, the pain and the difficulty that you've experienced or you've seen others walk through is exactly the thing that has kept you away from God. But for whatever reason, there's something in you that is stirring. You feel this thing that is drawing you to God. You're not even sure what that is. What I hope you understand is that that is God's spirit working in you to bring you to Him. Because the good news is that God loves you desperately. He wants a relationship with you so much so that 2000 years ago, he entered history in the person of Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He died a brutal death on the cross for your sins and for mine so that anybody who puts their trust in him would be forgiven. And the gospel tells us that Jesus did not stay dead, that he conquered death, hell, and the grave so that all of us could experience the life that he has achieved through his resurrection. And for whatever reason, there's something in you that's saying, that's what I've been missing my entire life. That's what I've been wanting. I've been longing for that. And the good news is, is that God is ready to meet you right where you are. He is offering you the gift of a relationship to be made new. All you have to do is to accept it, to say, Jesus, today I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning towards you. I need your love, your grace, and your mercy. Today, I give you my life. If that's you, simply lift your hand all over the place. If that's you and you're saying, Jesus, I want to give you my life. If you're watching with us, switch online or on YouTube, comment below, click that moment in the chat because we wanna walk with you in this journey of following Jesus because it is so much better together than alone. And here at Switch, we are a family. And so as those of you are making that decision around the world, we wanna pray with you and alongside you. So everybody together, repeat after me out loud, Heavenly Father, forgive me. I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning towards you. I need your love. I need your grace. I need your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen.